A warm good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. My name is Deeksha Dabkaura, and I'm a project manager of the Global Forest Expert Panels Program, in short, GFAP at UFRO. GFAP provides the mechanism for effective communication of scientific information and expertise to governments and intergovernmental processes related to forests and trees. Today, we share and discuss the findings of our latest publication entitled Forest, Trees and Poverty Alleviation in Africa, an Expanded Policy Brief. This policy brief was prepared by 20 leading scientific experts and in consultation with 207 stakeholders in Africa. It was recently launched in July 2021 at a virtual side event of the UN High Level Political Forum. This session will highlight the role of forests and trees in poverty alleviation in the context of Africa and contribute to the implementation of SDG 1, Ending Poverty. For your information, this session will be recorded. You are invited to contribute to the discussion by posting your questions in the Q&A box on your screen. I'm very pleased to introduce the speaker of today's session, Dr. Doris Muta. Dr. Muta is one of the editors and an author of the policy brief, and she is the senior program officer at African Forest Forum in Kenya. In this session, Dr. Muta will share the key evidence and major findings of this policy brief. Welcome, Doris. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So, Doris, you. to start with, could you please give us a brief introduction to this policy brief? Um, thank you, Diksha, for this opportunity. What we are presenting today on the expanded policy brief on forests, trees, and poverty elevation in Africa is a presentation of scientific evidence to demonstrate the relevance of forests and trees uh, to poverty elevation in Africa. In particular, the scientific evidence has been put together by the experts uh, all across the world, um, including African experts. And uh, this, this information has been put together to provide a better understanding of that relationship. And this relationship, particularly, we are looking at the relationship between the those who have and those who don't have. The disadvantage is the main focus of the people in the society. And we aim to look at how these disadvantaged people have interacted with the forest and tree resources in their livelihoods and how they sustain themselves, particularly in these times when we are faced with a number of global challenges the economic crisis is affecting livelihoods significantly, incomes are reduced, and the climate change is affecting them, the access to, to facilities that will help them to subsist, to subsist in their lives. And also the COVID pandemic has only magnified this important role of forests much more because we have finding that these people are relying more on the forest. It's a forest that they're, they're proving to provide reliance for them to adapt to impact of COVID and other climate global shocks. So this, this study was done and um, through this study, we have come up with a number of messages on how forests have been important um, at the local level and how these forests could be used better, could be better used to support levels and even increase through creation of wealth by the local people who live around the forest and are dependent on them. And one of the key issues, as uh, you will see along the way, is the inequality. This inequality between those who are poor and those who are not is very much magnified in how forests interplay with the livelihoods of these people. The other inequality is the gender inequality, the, where women are most dis more disadvantaged than the men in having access to the forest resources and capital to manage the resources for the benefit of the homes and for the livelihoods and incomes. And these are the key issues that we find that run through this, this policy brief that we have tried to explore through scientific evidence by many experts across the globe who have worked in Africa, including the African scientists. And also in addition, we have had stakeholder engagement that provided input into validating the evidence that we have generated and invalid and, and confirming as well, as well as adding more information and perspectives 
that science may not have already addressed. So this is a really robust report on the role of forests in, and trees in elevation of poverty in, among the African people. Thank you, Doris, for that great background information. So while we're talking about forests and poverty alleviation, um, could you tell us a little of about, is there adequate evidence on the role of forests um, forest and trees in poverty alleviation in Africa? And what does, what does the evidence indicate? Yeah, first of all, we, the, the policy is also targeted at informing governments informing uh, policy makers, mm -hmm. informing um, partners who are interested in forest, informing even other stakeholders like planners, economic planners, they, they, they should read this report because it, it shows how forest, although it's contributing to the livelihoods of the people, it's not captured in, in, the, in the national planning and budgeting. So we are targeting as well the scientists and academicians and uh, the evidence, as uh, we have said, that we have gathered on the role of forests and poverty is very much there. Evidence, uh, scientific evidence studies have been done on various aspects of forests, many forests in Africa, different forests from the rainforest to the Miombo, woodlands, the mangrove forests, the coastal forests, even the dry forests and Afro-Montane forests have shown, have contained a lot of wealth that are, that are contributing to the livelihoods of the local people and even the national economies. And despite the um, one, one aspect that we have also found through the study that despite the growth in the economies of these developing countries is still relatively low, yes, but we still find that poverty has still persisted. And the reason we find this is the case is because we have not yet captured the value of the forest into our national accounting system, into our development system, to enable it to increase the potential, to enable to harness the potential that it contains in order to benefit the communities as well as the government revenues as well. So these are the, some of the evidence and uh, the evidence we have found gathered cuts across all the sectors of our livelihoods energy provision by local people in the rural households. Around 80% of the rural household depend on energy based on forest, on biomass forest. And this is a very important contribution to the livelihoods of the people, the provision of energy. We also have other food and nutrition. Food, even the food that is already in the, in the modern economic space originated from the forest. And currently we have other foods, the indigenous foods that are providing valuable sources of nutrition and that are supporting the food security of the people living around and dependent on this forest. We also have timber extraction is uh, going on and uh, where local communities do have access, it is supporting their livelihood. And other, another very important component of the forest that is so, is so much, um, appreciated locally is the non-timber forest product. This non-timber forest product have been very, very valuable in, for example, providing um, health. Many medicinal plants uh, are, are being harvested from the forest sustainably for sus sustainable use in the, among the local communities. And we also have other products like the cosmetic products. The, the basis for their use is based on the local use of these people. And that's why you can see how important these forests are in supporting the livelihoods. And forests also products um, through the agroforestry systems, the tree based systems. Agroforestry is a very important landscape that we have seen has contributed a lot to the subsistence for communities through provision of products, forest products, food products, nutritious products at the farm level and at the household level. And also even some of these products are getting into the market. Thus they are able to, to generate income for their own livelihood and even to generate uh, um, other development projects. We also have uh, seen forests through agroforestry is supporting other sectors. It's supporting agriculture through agroforestry, it's supporting the livestock sector through the production of fodder trees 
and the large pastoral communities are benefiting from forests because of uh, the, the use of, the, of fodder trees and other fodder species. When you go to the coastal zone, we find that forests are also important in fisheries, which is another important nutrition that coastal communities rely on for their nutrition and food security. These are the main uh, uses of uh, forests that we have found evidence on. We've also found evidence on other, you know, um, apart from, you know, material benefits, non-material benefits, including cultural, spiritual, um, ecotourism, aesthetic, there is all there in the forest. And this is evidence that we have been able to establish that are very important, particularly this aspect of our well-being by the local communities where people are sustaining their, um, their well-being, the cultural and spiritual well-being through access to the forest, like the cultural, the sacred forest. And this is the evidence that we have been able to generate about the role of forest and people in, in poverty reduction in, in African countries. And these cases are all over Africa in terms of, um, we found some of the non-timber forest products I have, have gone even up to the international market. We talk of the shea butter, mm -hmm. we have in so honey. And uh, all these are just, um, just, just show how much valuable these forest and trees to poverty alleviation and also even beyond that to bring creating wealth for the communities and even creating uh, income for the governments. If only government could take better attention, more attention on how these forests are better managed to ensure that the economy also grows with that. We are also talking about green economy pathways. And this is one way, one very important way that governments could develop the economic uh, green pathways to ensure that they, are, they have sustainable economies that are based on green economy and therefore they, they, they have sustained sustainability in, 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 their, in the development of their country and of the peoples in their country. Great, thank you for that detailed um, information on the evidence of forest in poverty reduction. So um, now I wanted to dwell a little more on the forest management strategies and programs that have been effective in alleviating poverty in the case of Africa. Could you tell us a little, little about such uh, forest management strategies and programs? Okay, uh, forest management, of course, is the is the main uh, is our main meal here because we are foresters and we are advocating for the role of forest in in economic development that would also, um, if given the rightful attention, would be very uh, instrumental in creating um, wealth for the local communities and um, in uh, reducing poverty in the, in the continent. And of course, the important part is to make sure that these forests are sustainably managed. And uh, through the evidence we have generated, we have come across forest management strategies and programs that have been useful. And uh, I will just touch on a few of them. So one example of forest management is the community-based forest management. It's a very key. And participatory forest management is another very important forest management uh, approach. And uh, agroforestry, of course, is right in there when you get off the natural forest off the, um, in, onto the farm. We have agroforestry and also forest landscape restoration. And uh, for this to be effective, there are a number of mechanisms that uh, need to be put in place. And um, these uh, touch on um, levels to do with rights and particularly important in community-based forest management and participatory forest management. It's about ensuring that the local communities or rural people have rights they have ac access to the, um, to the resource, they have access to the mint to add value to that resource, they have um, secure ownership to even um, deriving benefits and keeping those benefits for them in a way that uh, does not disadvantage them. So as I said earlier, inequalities are very much prevalent in some of these um, issues. And this uh, leveraging of the rights is a, is a way of 
of turning that around, of that of minimizing the inequality. So some of the right best levers that I'd like to mention are tenure reforms, which are very, very useful in ensuring access to the forest resource and also access to land. Land tenure is, is a main, is an important issue that uh, gives that uh, community member the security that um, wherever, if I invest in this land, I will be able to benefit from it. And therefore, um, it, 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 uh, they're able now to be comfortable even to generate and, and add value to what their investment. And in order also to, to ensure that those benefits um, access are, um, are secured by, um, by the local communities, whereas um, oftentimes we find that uh, when it comes to access to the forest resources, there are those who are more powerful, those companies, those who are more wealthy, they do have a, an advantage. But one point that uh, needs to be done to ensure that the community also are not affected by that, a light capture. It has to be re reduced to the effect that communities are benefiting more. So those are some of the, um, the issues that need to be addressed, to be thinking about when you're looking at this uh, management approaches to forests to ensure that the communities also benefit uh, much, much more. And there are also other, other levers, for example, the, um, the regulatory levers. Regulatory levers are important in ensuring um, that law enforcement is, is done properly and that the illegalities are minimized and, uh, and therefore the, um, the, 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 the loss is, is, uh, is much less which means that there's more resource accessible for the local communities to benefit from. And another area is, uh, another approach to management is the protection forest. Protected areas are also very important. You find that um, in many areas of the, of the continent, these protected areas are also used as uh, tourism areas where wildlife is protected and uh, preserved and it's available and packaged into tourism destinations and tourism as you know in many African countries one of the top um, and of in income of the for the country and uh, in that arrangement you, we found that those communities that live near such areas have more um, opportunities to increase their wealth than those who are farther away because these uh, protected areas managed uh, through such arrangements are providing eco em employment opportunities and uh, also the, the spillover effect of the tourism is reaching the community living around the forest where tourists come and they also interact with the communities and they buy mm -hmm. their products and that way they are able to, to generate uh, an income for their livelihood. So th those are, are the key, some of the forest, for forest management areas that need to be, um, that can be addressed. To, to ensure that. Another lever, important lever, are the market-based levers. Here is where we have infrastructure that comes into play. The infrastructure to the extent that communities are able to move to the market area and sell their products and, uh, and thereby generate income for, from their, their products and their, and their livelihood and economic opportunities that they are exploiting. So these are very important for that. And um, we also have an issue of uh, the regulations for when communities or rural communities are engaging into a business enterprise. Because of the informality of the nature, they, they are entry into the, into the modern marketplace is constrained because of the regulations. There are so many licenses to apply and they're very costly and uh, very difficult uh, to, to process. And uh, by the time they're through with that process, they have spent all their, the little resources that they had and they spent all their time, they don't have much. So it's a disincentive. So to this end, it's important that uh, policymakers try the level best to simplify these um, regulations, to simplify the licensing, make it so simple and less costly that they are able also to access that formal market. And that's one of the levers that needs to be addressed to 
to formalize the informalities of the rural use of our, of our forest products in, in, the, in the local industries. Great, thank you. And what other factors are in play in this um, forest poverty dynamic and how can they influence the reduction of poverty in the context of Africa? Okay, yeah, and there are a number of contexts I've mentioned a little bit on the environmental context that we talked about the forest management, but uh, environmental context here at play, um, those issues that deal with uh, climate change. We have uh, climate change is having an, an important impact on the, on the livelihood on the forest and therefore affect also the livelihood. Mm -hmm. And also the related um, climate change policies need also have really need, need to also capture the, the forestry much more comprehensively so that they are able to, to, to have um, strategies and mechanisms that ensure that the forest use is supporting the resilience of the local community and is supporting the through adaptation mechanisms and also of course in carbon, carbon sequestration of the stem for mitigation of climate change impact. That is on the environmental context. We also have the social context, which I have said, um, there's a population dynamics that are, and consumption is an, an important uh, uh, social context that affect how forests are, how forests can influence, uh, how the forest poverty dynamics can influence the public elevation in Africa. We have uh, issues of uh, rural um, urban migration that also has an, an impact on, on that. And also we have issues of uh, where we have um, uh, some resources that are so valuable, not only to the countries, but also the international uh, community that are leading to conflict and therefore forests become, um, become compromised because, because of the valuation, as I've said, the valuation of the forest is, is, has not yet been captured comprehensively. And it's very important because this forest value is for today and also for tomorrow. And other uh, factors, economic context, we have financing. Financing uh, at the government level to forestry is very, very low. And I must say it is uh, mostly is less than 1% of the, of the government uh, funding to, to, to any, any other sector. And we have many, um, many of our forest management institutions that are underfunded and therefore they are not able to really be effective. And if they are facilitated more, financed some more, they will be able to provide um, an environment that community can, can generate even benefit, much more benefit from the forest. And we also have the, the global finance, access to global finance for African countries has also not been very adequate. We have um, um, issues of uh, much, much less access to global finance funding than in any other region. And this needs to be improved. We also have the global market dynamics where we have um, many of the products coming from, from Africa uh, demanding more and more of products that are, have been found to be responsible for deforestation. For example, plantations of rubber plantations of, um, of cocoa and the palm is, uh, is driven by the international market uh, demand for this product. And because it generates good revenue for the countries, it, um, it therefore provides an incentive for more and more uh, growing of, of those products through the plantations. And plantations are always often at the cost of the natural forest. So these are some of the, in the economic context that um, affecting the forest poverty dynamics in, 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 in Africa. There's also the, I have touched a bit on the policy and the political context where we have the, um, the allied capture, which I've, I've talked very much well. This is also one factor that needs to be, uh, to be looked at to minimize the inequality between the, those who have and those who don't have access to, to capital and others. Illegal logging and corruption is also another, another lever that, that, that should affect, that affects that. And uh, property rights and also protection of our technology and access to technology 
Also, one aspect also will be important is the uh, recognition of the use of traditional knowledge on, on forest products that is very, very important to unravel many, many more benefits for the forest that would help um, the local communities to increase, to improve their livelihoods and increase incomes and create even wealth. So those are the other contexts that I, uh, we have uh, generated evidence, scientific evidence on, and it's all in the policy brief. Thank you. And finally, what key messages would you like the audience and relevant stakeholders to take away from this policy brief? Yeah, thank you so much. That's a very important question. We have a whole executive summary in the policy brief on uh, key messages. And um, the first uh, important message is that uh, forest and tree-based systems have entire potential in poverty alleviation and sustainable development in Africa. This we have demonstrated through the, um, the benefits that uh, we have found that contribute to the current, it contribute the livelihood and the potential it has to even increase the, the benefits. For, for the people. And secondly, the forests and trees can contribute to the well being of the poor as they face profound global challenges. And uh, in this context of uh, current global challenges, forests are going to play a more and more important role in supporting local communities to, to mitigate the impact of these global challenges and generating. And when we, we focus on this, we'll be able to increase their resilience to global shocks now and in the future. And uh, the other issue is to do with the distribution of the benefits. We did find that the benefits are distributed unequally. And uh, this is a one message that uh, we have to take home and think about how to minimize these inequalities of, of benefit among the human people. And uh, another aspect that uh, we also came up, I, I would like to add to what I have said before is about cross-sectoral coordination. I did intimate about um, how agroforestry is a demonstration of forestry contributing to agriculture and, um, and also and has an impact on how land use policies will be designed. And um, forestry contributes to fisheries as well as subsidies as well to livestock. However, what we have found is that the coordination between those sectors has not been very, very good, has not been very effective. And this co sectoral coordination in land use policies would be able to avoid a lot of, uh, of, uh, of conflicts and minimize the costs that are being borne by the, by the poor. And also, as we have said uh, earlier, that there are measures, policy, that uh, will enable forest and trees to effectively address poverty goals. And those I have mentioned through the, um, that will include the mechanisms that are focused, that are pro-poor mechanisms that, um, empower the, the rights of the, of the local communities and including of women and uh, policies that are aimed to bridge the gap between those who have and those who do not have. So um, in, in concluding, I uh, would like to say that um, what our study and the evidence have generated is that the, the implications for policymakers that we if we urge that they recognize the importance of forests and trees to poverty alleviation goals, SDG1, and to prioritize policies to conserve, that will conserve and manage forests and tree-based systems, and support also more secure property rights, especially for forest-reliant, poor, women, and vulnerable groups, and also to tailor policies and programs to different contexts and design them to mitigate inequality and finally to strengthen policy alignment in the land use and forest sectors to advance poverty alleviation and sustainability goals in Africa. 
Thank you, Dory, for sharing this information on the policy brief. The expanded policy brief on forest and poverty in Africa presents a myriad of information for a range of stakeholders, and it is available for download on the UFRO website. The link to the webpage will be posted in the chat box now. We will now move on to the Q&A. Please post your questions to Dr. Muta in the Q&A box now. Again, please post your questions for Doris in the Q&A box now. We have about 15 minutes for um, questions and answers for Doris. Um, while, wait, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, uh, maybe I could ask one of my own questions. Um, so Doris, could you, could you tell us a little about what are the key barriers that decision makers should and could address to fully unleash the potential of forests to elevate poverty uh, in the context of Africa? Um, thank you, Diksha. Thank you for, for this opportunity once more again to share on the expanded policy brief on forest poverty aviation in Africa. Um, to come back to your question about the barriers, as I already highlighted in the video that uh, there are a number of constraints, a number of challenges that are constraining the ability of um, uh, harnessing the potential of forest to address uh, poverty alleviation, that are constraining local communities uh, access to, to make, um, you know, to make an income and also creation of wealth. Um, and I'd like to list just a few of them. The first one I would wish to list is on um, the issue of the social social structure. We have, as you said, we say there's a light capture. A light capture is one really potential barrier that uh, is limiting um, uh, access by the poor to access the opportunities to make an income from forest. For example, the logging companies, whenever there's an opportunity to have a, uh, to have a business opportunity, they have the capital, they have the resources, they even have the technology, and therefore they are able to benefit more, whereas the rural poor do not have those resources, and therefore they are disadvantaged. So that is one aspect that governments need to look at to make sure that whenever there's an opportunity, there's equal, there's a level playing ground for the local people to be able to access. For example, when it comes to um, access to, to the finances, the local people, uh, some of them are organized into groups and they need to build um, the capacity of these groups to be able to access uh, financing and uh, capital and also technology to, to be able to, to address the, the shortfall they have in uh, developing, for example, products that can generate uh, add value and generate income, not only locally, but also internationally. There's the issue also of uh, marketing information system. The information system uh, currently is only accessible to those who have those who have access to technology, those who have access to the, 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 the personnel that can go and look around for markets. But if this information is made available also to the local community, so they have access to the information on local markets, national markets, and also international markets, and also how even to achieve the standards that are required at the different uh, market levels. So that's another important um, aspect. The other uh, barrier we can see also is to do with the political issue. A lot of corruption is uh, still going on in, in, our, in our countries that we know uh, illegal logging is, is going on and law enforcement is incapacitated because of low capacity, low institutional capacity by our forestry institutions. 
So this law enforcement needs to be much more strengthened. And also they need to ensure accountability, accountability so that we there's transparency in how these transactions that are happening uh, along the value chain of this forest product is undertaken in order to ensure equitably um, equitable benefits that are available not only to other members of the public but also to the local value chain actors so that they're able to also access and benefit and raise their livelihood. So if they have better opportunities, you'll see how from we, we, the evidence we have that there's so much potential. The, the, the resources are already producing benefits, economic benefits, even cultural benefits. If they have an opportunity, the potential is can even be achieved much, much more higher and therefore raise the level of, uh, of livelihoods of these communities. And, uh, and we'll be therefore addressing SDG 1 to reduce poverty among every people everywhere. So uh, the other aspect uh, at the institutional level is the issue of, uh, of uh, financing. As we saw in the report that our domestic financing to forestry is very, very low. It's, it's as low as uh, 1% in some countries, it's a little bit higher, but it's very, very low. So if there is no adequate financing, even if we have uh, good programs, community-based forestry programs, but if they are not capacitated, for example, the extension arm of our forestry institutions has been very, very much weakened because of lack of funding. And this, are the, this is the mechanism that gets to the local people, the rural people who are close to the forest to help them to achieve sustainable forest management, sustainable, um, sustainable harvesting, sustainable access to the forest resources, and even the, to teach, to give capacity for them to be able to access benefits from the forest. So if financing is limited, then we have a big constraint there. That's another, another barrier. The other barrier that uh, we have also identified is to do with the, the rights, secure rights, land rights. Land rights are not equitably accessed. Property rights are also very weak with respect to the community uh, forest lands. And therefore it is an, an important issue that could really help our, our forest systems to minimize the inequalities, to fix the inequalities so that everyone has access to opportunities, to access the resources and also opportunities to generate income. And eventually once the income is raised, then the government revenue is likely to increase and also and therefore will be increasing our well-being and our on our national growth for the countries in Africa. Also, there's the issue of a benefit sharing. Benefit sharing is still an issue that we have found to be very, very important, but we have not done enough. Intellectual property rights are still skewed towards uh, international companies because they have the means and the access. And also because in our other countries, we are still handling our local forestry production activities as informal, and therefore we're not paying enough attention to them. So that's where we, we still have that challenge of making sure that we have, we bring the informality in the forestry sector, especially at that level or the rural level, to a formal, a formal level where there's equal treatment, equal access, minimal cost to the local people and local value, value value actors so they're able to generate income and therefore build their, their well-being. Thank you. Now, thank you so much. This was some good insights. And um, we have time for one more question. So if there is any questions, please um, put it in the Q&A box. Okay, so you already touched a little on uh, forest products and value chains um, in the same line of things. What is your recommendation on forest enterprise development and what can the international community do to assist in increasing the value of African forest products? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, discussed a lot about enterprise and we feel it's one of the 
um, the areas that uh, has a lot of potential, but not enough attention has been provided to harness the potential. So the small and um, medium-sized enterprises are very much um, on the ground. They, uh, they interact with the forest very, very closely and very, very intimately. That's where, because that's where they get their livelihoods. However, from our studies, even from studies that we have done in, in my institution, the African Forest Forum, we have found that these groups are very uh, much dispersed. They're not cohesive. They are, they are therefore at a disadvantage because they're not cohesive. They're not able to, to dialogue with any developer, any developing actor. And therefore the important thing for is to find ways to make them cohesive to be a cohesive group that is able to dialogue, that is able to negotiate. That's why you find the companies are coming and they're collecting uh, their knowledge, collecting the products and going away with the raw material. And the material goes, goes and is developed through laboratories there, it's, it's developed, it's derived, and its value is added. And then it comes back as a refined product and you find that the value is much higher. But how much of that, uh, benefit comes back to this SMEs is very very little. Oftentimes they don't even know that uh, it's what is going, how it's going to be developed and what's going to come out of it because there's no disclosure, and it's because of the disadvantaged position. So they need to build their capacity to be able to negotiate. So they need negotiation skills. They need to have. Um, a framework, the government needs to be, provide a framework that protects their interests, that makes sure if anything is, uh, is accessed from the country, from the local communities, there's first of all full disclosure of where this uh, much is coming from, full disclosure of uh, what's going to come out of it, what development will happen, even wherever it will go, what is a it has to be fully disclosed what's going to happen out of it and all, all the benefits that could come out of that. So that is what we uh, would urge the international community to ensure that there is accountability. Whatever material has developed, product has been developed from a team from outside, it should be disclosed where it has come from and to ensure that the benefits also are not just staying in the, with the company, but they're also recorded back to the local community. So they need to advocate more for equality, advocate more for equitable sharing of the benefits, and also advocate more for the rights of the, of the community where the material could be coming from. So that is a, what, one aspect that needs to happen. Another aspect is for governments need to, to build, provide resources for these groups, these SME groups, that they're able to, to have an institution that is strong and stable and is able to even add value, add value to the products. Access to technology should be made easy for them. Government should provide subsidies for them to have technologies that they can use to process and add value to the product and also assist, assist them to market the products that they're able to generate more revenue. And when they are formalized, as I said earlier, formalization will be very critical. When the benefits do come back to these groups, they will be captured in the taxes that goes to the government exchequer. And therefore that becomes a win-win arrangement for, for the SMEs. And also it's, it's important also to, to build the capacity of these groups to be able to access financing, not just from government, but also from other financing institutions so that they're able to be um, accountable to, to, to the, whoever is giving them credit, so they're able to, to generate enough revenue, enough uh, be benefits, so that they're able to maintain that relationship with the financial institution. So financial management skills will be important for this group, they need that capacity building. And this would be also important for the international community to to, to provide funding, to provide funding that can support such groups to even develop um, uh, bankable projects that they're able to generate and, and build themselves as a, as a subsector of the economy of the countries in Africa. And this way, the resources will be, um, will be beneficial 
not only to the local people, but also to the, to the countries, the national economy was. And therefore, this, the, the forest will be sustainably managed. And that is what we all are, are looking for. That is all we need to ensure that these forests are availing, available to provide not only subsistence, beyond subsistence, to create wealth, to create revenue for the, for the livelihoods of the people and also for the government. And therefore, then the government can come back and uh, in, invest back the money into the local communities, forestry based enterprises. Also, another aspect that uh, we know that the activities are very informal. One reason uh, governments have not been uh, spending enough on these uh, forestry resources and forest based enterprises because they do not have adequate information on the value. The value of the forest and the value of these products is, is little understood. And that was one of the findings that we in the in the panel uh, discussed, and uh, we recommend that more studies are done, more studies beyond what we've done on economic valuation, so that the value, the true value of these uh, resources, contribution to the livelihoods, and the potential value that could uh, could generate out of that could be captured, and therefore that can become now a, a major contribution to the government revenue and to the forestry sector as a whole. And that would also help to profile better forestry for our national economies in the continent. Great, thank you so much. There were some great presentations there. Um, so that was the time that we had today for the Q&A. Um, many thanks to Doris and of course the audience for the great discussion on the roles of forests and trees um, in poverty alleviation in Africa. The policy brief, the link to the policy brief is posted in the chat box. So you will be able to download um, the English version of the policy brief from there. However, it might be of interest for you that the policy brief will soon be available in Portuguese and French as well. We hope you'll find the findings of this policy brief valuable in the development and facilitation of effective poverty alleviation strategies in Africa, and of course, in catalyzing national, regional, and international action to achieve the sustainable development goals and realize the African Union vision of 2063. Again, thank you for your attention. And with that, we come to the close of this webinar. However, I do invite you to join other sessions during the Euphra World Day as suited to your interest. Good day, good evening, and good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. And have a good evening, too. Thank you. Okay, bye. bye.